Today we're in Luke 21, and we're looking at just a few verses in Luke 21, but there was a lot here, so I encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along. Luke 21, why don't you stand with me, and we'll read the Word of God together, starting at verse 20. Luke 21, 20 says this, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the time is even closer today than it was the day Jesus uttered this, that Jesus will come for his church, we will go home, and then one day witness Jesus coming in power and great glory to all the world. As we get ready to celebrate the first advent of our Lord, we look forward to his second advent, his return. Give us grace when we look at your word today. Guide us through your scriptures. Help us think them through, but teach us by your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good questions deserve good answers. Not that every question is good. Not that every answer is direct. Many of us probably remember our teachers saying that there's no such thing as a dumb question, to which immediately some of us went about trying to prove them wrong. And did. (laughs) But with the truly good questions, we want answers, and thankfully the Bible provides them. Now, they may not always be the answers we like or expect, because you know sometimes the answer is no, we don't like that. But answers they are, and we need to accept them as they are. And the same thing applies to questions about the end times. For as much as is debated, and as much as we may not know, the Bible actually does provide us many, many answers regarding end times theology. Now granted, occasionally the answer is that we're not supposed to know the answer, right? or at least the specifics, as when the disciples asked Jesus if this was the time he was about to restore the kingdom to Israel. He says it's not for you to know those things, but he had another job for them to do, the Great Commission. Read about that in Acts chapter 1. Jesus did, though, give them an answer. Just wasn't one they expected. Other times, the answers are detailed, such as here in Luke 21, regarding the signs of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, in answering that question, Jesus provided signs for one additional and far more important event, and that's his return at the end of the age. Those questions were asked and answered. All the disciples now needed to do was to pay attention and to keep their hope in Jesus. Now, we've got to remember how we got to this point. Chronologically speaking, in the book of Luke, this here, even though we're about to celebrate Christmas, in Luke, this is the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's come to the city of Jerusalem. He's encountered a lot of opposition from the religious leaders. He's countered their every move. He exposed them as the hypocrites that they were. Of course, if they were willing to humble themselves and receive Jesus as the Messiah, things would have been different. But their rejection of him led to further rebellion against God, led to their condemnation. And many of the arguments that he had seemed to have been taking place within the temple grounds and around the uh, temple grounds. And we know the conflicts with the religious leaders actually did end there because Jesus was able to compare the hypocrisy of the religious leaders to the sincere worship of a poor Jewish widow. She had given God everything that she had. She literally loved God with her whole livelihood. Now, while they're in the temple, the disciples were looking around at this truly magnificent structure. They were admiring the craftsmanship that was there. And that's when Jesus gave them a very sobering prophecy. He said one day that temple would be destroyed. Destroyed, not just damaged, not neglected and falling into disrepair, 
he's talking about utter destruction in which not one stone will be left upon another. And that was terrible news for the disciples because the, the temple was more than their place of worship. It was a symbol of their nation. It was a symbol of their relationship with God. The last time their temple was destroyed, the people were plunged into Babylonian captivity and men, women, and children all suffered horrendously. And so for the temple to be destroyed again, it would mean the same thing happening to their nation all over again. And history shows us that it did. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in light of the prophecy, the disciples asked two logical questions. First question was, when? Second question was, what sign? Look up at verse 7, and it says this. And hopefully my voice will last through the message today. We'll find out. Verse 7 says this, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now, last week we saw that Jesus answered the question, when? By telling the disciples to wait. Again, not all the answers we get are precise. That one was not exactly as precise as they wanted, but it was what they needed to hear. There would be many years in which various deceivers would come, trials would come, but the disciples... And of course, all the Christians who followed were not to panic. They were to trust in God. God would keep them. And they could use all those opportunities that they had in these trials to testify of him. It's the second question that Jesus tackles next in our text here today. And that is, what sign? And this he answers with great specificity, telling the disciples exactly what to expect in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem. And thus the Jewish temple which they were so concerned about. But that's not all Jesus tells them. He says, yes, their city and their temple would be laid to waste, but their hope would not. Because when their faith is in Christ, their hope is not in a physical temple. It's in the Son of God. When our hope is in Christ, we have hope in our redemption, and that's true hope indeed. So we want to wait for Him and watch for Him. So it's Two basic parts here. First is the signs of Jerusalem's destructions. We start in verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now stop there, because if the disciples are looking for a sign, Jesus just gave them one, and this one was going to be crystal clear. When they could look over the city walls and see Jerusalem completely surrounded by armies, that was the sign. The desolation was at hand. Unlike at other times in Jerusalem's history where the city was miraculously delivered by God, such as when an angel of the Lord appeared and destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers overnight, that wasn't going to happen this time. This time there would be no deliverance. When Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, that was it. God would allow Jerusalem to be destroyed, be devastated to the point of being pretty much completely uninhabitable. Thus, when Jesus' disciples saw the siege begin, he says the time's at hand. Now, it's worth noting at this point, because we know that the Gospel of Luke is not the only Gospel in our Scriptures, there appears to be a lot of overlap between Luke and the other two synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark. On this point, the answers are actually quite different. All three authors write of the destruction of the city, but they write of different destructions at different times. And you say, wait a second, how can we know that for certain? Because Jesus speaks of two different signs. Luke writes of Jesus describing how Jerusalem will be surrounded by these armies. Matthew and Mark write of something far more ominous, because we would think, what could be worse than a military siege in which everybody's going to be destroyed what could be worse is a supernatural revelation of the Antichrist. And we read this, and Matthew's telling in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 15, and 16, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Of course, to understand, we actually have to turn back to Daniel, don't we? So we read... Daniel's telling, Daniel 9, 26 and 27, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, time forbids a, a thorough study of these verses, but here are the basics. 
The 62 weeks that are mentioned here are the second part of a seven-week plus 62-week promise of time. And read about that in Daniel 9, verse 25. Thus, after 69 weeks of years, because each of those weeks is a period of seven years, after those 69 weeks of years, the Messiah is to be revealed to Israel only to be suddenly cut off by an unnamed prince. And that prince, that ruler, will forge a peace agreement for that final week of years in which, in the middle, he commits this act that's called the abomination of desolation. And that's a desecration of the temple that brings an end to sacrifice, as mentioned here. The ruler who does that is who the Bible calls Antichrist. And that act is this singular act pointed to by Jesus in the book of Matthew as being the precursor to terrible destruction. That ought to get our attention. But in Luke, that act is not mentioned at all. For Matthew, that is the preeminent sign. That is the sign of the destruction, the abomination of desolations. And Luke is Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. Two different signs. Question. Couldn't both gospel writers still be writing about the same general event? Well, to answer, we need to look at history. Has the sign spoken of in Matthew 24, 15 actually happened? No, not since the time in the prophecy of Jesus. There was an event in 167 BC in which the Seleucid general Antiochus Epiphanes prefigured this event. He desecrated the Jerusalem temple. He sacrificed a pig there. He erected an altar to Zeus there. And even that prefiguring act was foretold by Daniel in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. But that was obviously not the act originally spoken of Daniel the prophet, because Jesus still prophesied of it in the present tense, saying that was still yet to come. The future tense, that sign is still future. Okay, what about the sign spoken of in Luke? Has Jerusalem ever been, since Jesus' prophecy, surrounded by armies and completely destroyed? Yes, it has. In 70 A.D., when the Roman general Titus conquered the city and his soldiers burned the Jerusalem temple to the ground. Thus, there are two different signs, two different fulfillments, all in one prophetic teaching. And you say, well, okay, fine. Why is this so important to us? Because correct discernment on this issue keeps us from false teaching. Correct discernment on this issue even keeps us from heresy on another related issue, and that's Jesus' return. See, when it comes to the timeline of prophetic fulfillment, we might look at it as a continuum that reaches one direction into the past and another direction into the future. And we can point to a lot of prophecies that have already been fulfilled in the past. For instance, the prophecies concerning Jesus' birth, His resurrection, His crucifixion, all those, the coming of the Holy Spirit, all of those have been fulfilled. We've seen those things already. There are other prophecies, though, that point to the future. Jesus' return, the new heavens, the new earth, the eternal state, those are all yet to come. All right, continuum of thought. Now, among theologians, there's a school of thought called preterism, which teaches that all biblical prophecy is already fulfilled. In other words, anything that the Bible said was going to happen has already happened. And to a full preterist, that includes all the prophecies of Jesus' return. To a full preterist, we're in the new heavens and the new earth right now, which i got to say is pretty darn disappointing. <laughs> If you look around at the culture. Now, that extreme form of preterism is downright heresy. There is no other way to describe that because it teaches that Jesus has already returned when, in fact, he has not. Now, a more moderated view, one that is very common in Christianity today, is called partial preterism, which sees most of prophecies, with the exception of Jesus' return, as being already fulfilled. And they point to prophecies such as Luke 21, verse 20, as proof. And they claim that since it is a historical fact that Jerusalem was indeed surrounded by enemies and conquered, and because this came in the midst of Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives, that the prophecies of all the Olivet Discourse have been fulfilled. Now, that's not necessarily a heretical view, but it is false teaching. It is incorrect. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed, but the abomination of desolation has not yet taken place. Jesus gave one series of prophetic teaching, but he spoke of two times of great distress for Israel, one for their immediate present, the Roman conquest, and one for the far future, the Great Tribulation. Now, I understand that this may seem like the weeds of theology, and it's just something debated by scholars in ivory towers and seminaries. This is actually very important for all of us. How so? Because this helps us keep our hope in Christ. Recognizing what has already been fulfilled gives us confidence regarding what is yet to be fulfilled. 
Wrapped up in all of this is what? Jesus has promised to rapture his church so that where he is, we may be also. John 14, 3. Wrapped up in all of this is a biblical guarantee that the church is not appointed to face the wrath of God as such will come during the Great Tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Wrapped up in all of this is the fact that God will one day turn his attention again to Israel in order that all of his promises to his nation will be fulfilled. So put it all together, what do we have? When we're looking at it correctly, we have a sure hope in Christ Jesus who is the faithful God. He's faithful to every bit of his word to fulfill it exactly as he said that he would. That's why it matters. Verse 21, let's look at some more of this. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The response to seeing this sign, the sign is the army surrounding Jerusalem. What's the response to that? He says, run. Run. Get out of town. For the Jews who had witnessed such a thing, they were to get out as quick as they could and not look back. It's like when the angel has pled with Lot to get out of Sodom. You know, get out. Don't go back. Don't even turn around. The people who saw the Romans were to not hesitate. They were just to get out, just to flee. They were going to go anywhere except Jerusalem. It was a city that was in grave danger, and those who remained within it would be destroyed, and of course they were. Now again, if you're comparing Matthew and Luke and Mark and Luke, there's, there's a lot of overlap here. Matthew's account telling people to flee to the mountains, not even going back home to pack. Even with that overlap, we've got to keep in mind the situations may be similar, but the time frame is different. It brings up a good question. With all this overlap that's between these biblical writers, how is it possible that they could record Jesus talking about two very different events, especially when he's speaking the singular time on the Mount of Olives? This is all the Olivet Discourse. Well, what the Gospel writers demonstrate is something that's been very, very common as you've been with us, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, studying the Old Testament. All right, this is a singular prophecy with two fulfillments. There's a near fulfillment, there's a far fulfillment. For example, take another uh, situation entirely. When God promised David to build him a house, grant him a son, that God himself would be his father, 2 Samuel 7, 13 and 14, we know that's speaking of Jesus, but we also know that's speaking of someone else, speaking of Solomon. How do we know that? Because God said in 2 Samuel 14 that he would chasten that one when he sinned. We know Jesus never sinned. Two fulfillments. There's a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. All right? It's called a mountain peaks of prophecy among uh, theological scholars. If you're looking at a mountain range in the distance, everything looks like it's right on top of another. But when you get up close, those mountains can be separated by miles and miles and miles. All right? The same sort of idea here. There's a near fulfillment, a far fulfillment. Same thing happens here with the Olivet Discourse. Jesus taught one Olivet Discourse, but in it he taught both the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, as well as the future destruction that takes place during the Great Tribulation. The difference between Luke... And that of Matthew and Mark is that Luke concentrated his writing on one aspect. Matthew and Mark looked at the other. Well, why the difference? Well, they're different authors, different audiences, different purposes. Anything beyond that is speculation. We can ask Jesus when we see him, though I doubt we'll care when we actually do. Okay? So things are going to get really, really bad, though, for these people once Jerusalem surrounded by these armies. Why would things be allowed to get so bad? Because that was the wrath of God appointed to Israel. Look at what Jesus said. So very clear. These are the days of vengeance. Unless we try to water that down. The Greek word vengeance means exactly that. Vengeance, punishment, giving of justice, retaliation. You say, retaliation for what? What did they do to deserve this sort of thing? Well, because the Jews would reject Jesus as the Messiah. Remember the prophecy from Daniel 9. The Messiah was to be cut off after he entered Jerusalem. Understand that Jesus is uttering this on the Mount of Olives hours before he's about to be cut off, right? This was about to be fulfilled right before their very eyes in a matter of hours. He, as the Messiah, had entered Jerusalem exactly according to the timeline of prophecy. At the end of those 69 weeks of years, he would soon be cut off when the Jews delivered him over to the Romans to be crucified. That's betrayal of the worst kind. That's treason of the highest order. This is a nation called by God, set apart by God, and they would literally take the king, sent to them by God, give him an excruciating death on the cross. You know, it's bad enough to betray a normal man, but far worse to betray the Son of Man, the Son of God. If there's any act that deserves the utter wrath of God and retaliation of God, that would be it. 
So it ought to be no wonder that these would be the days of vengeance. And not that that should have been any surprise. The things that the Jewish nation experienced as a result of the rejection of Jesus would be awful, but they were prophesied. These things that would happen would be the things that had been written. These things would now be fulfilled. Understand to reject Jesus is to reject their covenant. And if you reject the covenant, then you incur all the curses included in the covenant spelled out for them by Moses, Deuteronomy 28, many other places in the Scripture. You, know, you read over those curses and you think, well, that's fulfilled with Babylon. Well, yes, it is, but it's also fulfilled when Romans came in and destroyed the people exactly as God said that they would. The takeaway here, guys, is don't reject Jesus. For the Jews, they were about to experience two terrible periods of the wrath of God. First, when the Romans destroyed the city, then millennia later during the Great Tribulation. That's the period known as the Day of Jacob's Trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. But you know, if that's all reserved for the nation of Israel, how much worse is it for anybody else? The only good thing about either day of trouble for Israel is that it has an end date. It can only go so far. The same can't be said about eternal hell. Those who ultimately reject Jesus will face something far worse than the Great Tribulation. They will endure the wrath of God for all eternity. His righteous response to our sin against Him. That's not God's desire for us. God wants us to be saved. And we can be saved. We just need to turn to Jesus. But speaking about the trials of those days, he goes on in verse 23, But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Why woe to the mothers? Because of how hard it is for them to move quickly. Parents of infants know how hard it is to get your kids in a car just to go to a grocery store. <laughs> Much less you've got to flee in a moment of panic. Thousands would die. And although that's righteous vengeance, that's not God's desire. So Jesus declares his woe. Jesus in chapter 19 wept over the city. You might recall as he entered the city, he wept openly and aloud and bitterly over the city because he didn't want to see these people be destroyed. Now ultimately their destruction is their choice because of their decision to refuse Jesus. Just like anybody who ends up in hell has a choice not to. But that's what they would face. By the way, please notice again, this is this people. And it says very specifically, great distress of the land and wrath upon this people. In other words, the Jews. Terrible time for Israel. One more indication, he's referring to a different time than the Great Tribulation. How so? Because the Great Tribulation is not just for Israel, it's for all the world. Apart from God's mercy, it would be possible for pretty much worldwide annihilation of all flesh during the days of the Great Tribulation. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that unless the days were shortened, no one would live. Matthew 24, verse 22. Again, the fact that they are limited, there's an end date to it, there's the mercy of God. So how bad is going to be the history, or how bad was, we should say, the historical destruction for Israel? Look at verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Edge of the sword is an interesting phrase, actually, because literally it's the mouth of the sword. Uh, one lexicon described it this way, saying the sword like the jaws of a wild animal devours people. And it really did devour them. Josephus, the historian Josephus, wrote that 1,100,000 Jews were killed. A number of 97,000 were taken captive. Now, you've got to know a lot of scholars think that he was exaggerating the numbers. But considering we don't have another historical account, those are the best numbers we've got. And even if Josephus inflated the numbers, and of course he's not writing inspired scripture, he could have. But even if he's inflating the numbers, there's no question that the number of fallen was absolutely massive. Thousands upon thousands of people died. And apart from the death toll, the city itself was not only devastated, but was completely taken over by the Roman Gentiles. There was that decimation, then there was another conquering that took place from the Romans after the Bar Kokhba revolt. And after that point, Jews were even forbidden to return, except with one day a year being an exception. So just as Jesus said, it was trampled by the Gentiles. Control of the city went to the Romans, both the unified Romans and after they split into the Byzantine Empire. It went from them to the Islamic Caliphate, to the Crusaders, to the Turkish Ottoman. That takes us all the way to the modern area where it was uh, uh, given over to the British Mandate, eventually won by the Israelis in the 1948 and the 1967 wars. Now there's always been a Jewish presence in the city throughout the ages, but it could have been very, very small. Apparently, only two Jewish families were found in the entire city in 1267 A.D. 
Uh, but the Jews obviously did not have control at those times. It was trampled by the Gentiles exactly according to prophecy. Jesus always speaks the truth. One thing he also speaks the truth of is that there is coming a day in which that will no longer be the case. One day, the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. By the way, Paul seemingly wrote of this exact same thing when he's writing to the Romans. Romans 11, verse 25 through 27, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is My covenant with them when I take away their sins. So God may have poured out His vengeance upon Israel, but He still loves Israel. He still has promises for them. He still has a plan for them, and that includes their salvation. And He says very clearly here that one day all Israel will be saved. The blinders that are on their eyes now will one day be removed. They'll see Jesus as Messiah. And they'll come home to their true relationship with God. And that will be a glorious, glorious day. That's a day that all Christians can rejoice. Why is that? Because people get saved. That's why. And so we ought to be praying for that day. And by the way, this is one reason why it's so exciting to be living in this current day and age. With all the problems we see in our culture and around the world, it can get very discouraging. But you know what? Those are expected signs of the end. And we know we're getting close to the end when we see God doing the work that He's doing in Israel. Because guess what? The Jewish people once again have a Jewish state. The Jewish capital is once again the ancient city of Jerusalem. <laughs> Finally just recognized by the United States as such. Even so, it's still apparent right now Jerusalem still trampled by Gentiles. Jews share control with the Palestinians over the city and one of the most important mosques in Islam is uh, built right on top of the Temple Mount. So right now it's still the time of the Gentiles. But not for long. This last phrase, by the way, regarding the times of the Gentiles becomes very important from a chronological perspective of this prophecy because that now takes us from 70 A.D. to the present time and beyond. And that one phrase is 2,000 plus years, bridging the second part of Jesus' answer regarding the times of the end. Look at verse 25, because now we go from the signs of Jerusalem's destruction to the signs of Jesus' return, verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress with nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. At this point, it ought to be very, very obvious that Jesus is no longer speaking of 70 A.D. All of the arguments of the partial preterists get pushed aside here because these kinds of supernatural worldwide signs have never been seen in the history of the world. History plainly shows us the fulfillment of verses 20 through 24, Israel seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. History is silent on 25, verse through 28. Here we see those various mountain peaks of prophecy come to a close. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they're all writing again now of the same event. Now they're all writing of the second advent of the Lord Jesus. These sorts of cosmic signs are exactly what are prophesied to take place during the days of the Great Tribulation. One section we see this in Scripture is in the book of Joel. Now, Joel 2 is perhaps best known for Peter's quotation on the day of Pentecost regarding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to explain how it was the disciples were speaking in tongues and prophesying. I read that in Joel 2, verses 28 through 29. But the very Succeeding verses, following verses, go on to speak of the various signs that take place in the heavens. We read Joel 2, verses 30 through 32, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. The Holy Spirit is poured out in this present day. But there's coming a future day in which all the physical universe will testify the imminent arrival of the Lord Jesus. And until that moment comes, the opportunity exists for anyone to be saved. You know, the days of the Great Tribulation will be awful. There will be much suffering. But each and every one of those trials during the Great Tribulation serves as a powerful witness to the reality of God. And every single time that someone witnesses a sign in the heavens, another meteor come, or the, the earth 
rolling and, and earthquakes and all the rest, everything they see, there will be one more opportunity for someone else to turn to faith in Jesus and be saved. Every time they witness the fulfillment of prophecy is another extension of the mercy of God. God wants them to be saved and He will make His offer as blatant as possible. Yet sadly, many will still reject His mercies. Not only are there signs prophesied, but so is the response of mankind. Uh, Jesus said here that uh, the men's hearts will fail them from fear. Jesus emphasized this again in his uh, revelation to John. We read this in Revelation 6, 12 through 17. I looked when he opened the sixth seal. Behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth as hair. The moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. That ought to sound very familiar to what we just read in Luke 21 here. It says in verse 15, Then the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, mighty men, every slave and free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, through the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? Praise the Lord, many will come to faith, but Revelation tells us that. But mankind as a whole will continue to reject Jesus. They will recognize the day of His wrath, yet they will do nothing except run from Him in terror. And no doubt they'll be terrified. Jesus describes in Luke 21 as their hearts failing them. Interesting word. It's the only time that the word is used in the New Testament. And it can speak of fainting, but it really points more solidly towards death. A little tr literal translation of the compound word speaks of away from life. That implies serious panic. We use the English terms hearts failing to describe terms that we see in the, in the Old Testament about a lapse in courage. Uh, when David w alone had the courage to go fight Goliath and everybody else in the armies of Israel, their hearts failed them, 1 Samuel 17, 32. That's a lapse in courage. This word here applies and implies really to a physical collapse from fear. Their life leaving them. As men and women witness the goings-on of the Great Tribulation, they will experience such great perplexity, anxiety, such terrible fear, it will paralyze them. It will be evident of what's soon to come, and yet they do nothing except cower and faint. Now that's them. It doesn't have to be anybody. Though men and women all over the world will fear the days of the Great Tribulation and flee the outpouring of the wrath of God on the earth, no single born-again Christian will endure it. See, this is where the glorious promise of the rapture comes in. Before the Great Tribulation breaks out in full swing, Jesus will take us home to be with Him. He'll take us home away from the trials of this world. Now understand this. The promise of the rapture does not exempt any Christian from regular sufferings, trials, and tribulations. Those things just come with life. But it does exempt us from the future great tribulation. We suffer the regular course of the world today, but we will not endure the wrath of God in that day. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus, that that day will descend from heaven, and the trumpet of God, He will call us up to be with Him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. We escape the day of the great tribulation. That's the promise available to every single born-again Christian. And if you're not certain that you will be with Jesus at that time, you can be. You need to put your faith in Him. Now, as terrible, again, we've mentioned this before, as terrible as it'll be, it'll come to an end. What will happen when those great cosmic signs have come to a close? Jesus says there'll be one last sign, and that will be Jesus Himself. Look at verse 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Right here, this is the second advent. This is the second coming. This is the return of the Lord Jesus to the earth as he arrives with all the power and the glory of God. We mentioned it already at Christmas. We celebrate the first advent. At that time, think how much humility it was Jesus arrived in. Born of a virgin mother, a young girl. She was most likely ostracized by her town as her betrothed husband, her engaged husband-to-be, took her in really as an act of mercy. They were young, they were impoverished, they had traveled the Judean uh, countryside to Bethlehem. 
Why? Because they're compelled to do so. They're obeying the, the command of a Gentile emperor. They had no power over that. She had no crib to, to lay the baby in. He had to be laid in an animal's feeding trough. Soon enough, they have to flee to Egypt as refugees away from the madness of King Herod. You know, if we were to write and invent the story for ourselves, we couldn't make the first advent any more humble than what's already in the Scriptures. That's what Jesus came into. No one came in with a more humble birth than Him. Yet that's not how His second advent will be. The second advent will be glorious. It will be powerful. It will be incredible. The world will not be able to die. The imagery is actually that from the book of Daniel once more. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He, brought the ancient, he came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. See, while he was in Babylon, Daniel had a vision of the true king of kings in the very moment that Jesus received all of his kingdoms. And understand, to come in the cloud of heaven is to come in the weighty glory, the visible glory of God. When Jesus led them through the wilderness, what did he lead his people with? Oh, he led them with the cloud of his glory. When Jesus descended on Mount Sinai, how did he come? He came with the cloud of his glory. When he blessed the original tabernacle and temple, took up the original sacrifices, what happened? The cloud of God's glory filled those rooms. When Jesus comes back, how will he come? and a cloud with power and great glory. By the way, that was confirmed to the disciples by the angel when they saw Jesus ascend to the heaven in a cloud. They said, He'll come back in the same way. Acts 1, 9-11. He'll come back in the cloud. The point, guys, is our Lord is coming back, and it's going to be awesome. And at that moment, we as His church will accompany Him as He leads us heavenly armies, and victory over all the armies of Antichrist in the world. There'll be no person who can stand against him in that day. And there's a single word from his mouth will call all of his enemies to fall. It will be unlike anything the world has ever yet seen. Never forget that our God is glorious and our Lord Jesus has the victory. Never forget that. It can be really easy to get the idea from our culture as we look around today that Christianity is somehow in retreat. Atheism is on the rise. Secular science is worshipped as a false religion. People are leaving the institutional church by the droves. Biblical morality is increasingly rejected. The Bible itself is pushed aside even by professing Christians. If our faith was driven by opinion polls, we'd have every reason to start taking antidepressants. But it's not. Our faith is driven by the short promise of the living God, and there's no doubt that His word is true. Amen. Jesus told us He would be rejected by the Jews, and guess what He was? Jesus told us He would go to the cross, and He was. Jesus told us He would rise from the dead, and He did. He told us that He'd send His Spirit, build His church, equip us as His followers, which He had. He also told us that things will get worse before they get better, so that ought not be a surprise. But guess what? They're going to get a lot better. Jesus is returning. And when he does, it'll be victorious. How glorious the hope is for the born-again Christian. He is our hope. And he's a hope that will never fail. Look at verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen. Jesus looks ahead to the Days of the Great Tribulation, you can say with utter confidence that the Jews and the Gentile saints of that time would have great hope because the nations of the world, their hearts would fail with fear, but those who are saved would see every passing sign as another step closer to the return of Jesus and the redemption. Now, for us, we as the church will be with Jesus during that time. But we can relate this prophecy to the current day, can't we? Because we look around our culture and our times, and although things look terrible... We can lift our heads in hope, knowing that the day is at hand. Amen. Our redemption draws near. Our redemption from sin is accomplished. Our redemption from this world will be complete when we see Jesus face to face. So Jesus answered the second question of his disciples. And when he did, he answered questions about his second advent. 
He gave them very specific things to watch for in the near future. He also spoke to generations yet to come what would await them prior to his return. Now, we've got to look at this application in a couple of different ways, right? Because there was a media application to the Jews of that day. He warned them to get ready to get out, right? Because of the prophesied rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, that generation would face terrible vengeance. The Romans would come in to level the city. Thus, Jesus warned them to flee the destruction soon to come. Why the warning? Because although many would die, God did not want them to die. He warned them in advance. Far better than death was their redemption. They had the opportunity to be saved if they just humbled themselves, put their faith in Jesus. And it's the same with everybody. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He would much rather we turn from our wicked ways and live, Ezekiel 33, 11. That's true for Jews and Gentiles alike. Many will be saved during the great tribulation. Their hope will be in the arrival of Jesus. The key, don't wait that long. The sooner we're saved, the better. We're guaranteed a moment to see God. We just don't know when that moment will be. We don't want to wait till it's too late. Jesus has offered us His redemption. We need to hope in Him today. Christian, born again Christian, what do we do? We hope in our redemption. Jesus is coming. Wait and watch. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. And thank you that our Lord Jesus is coming for us. I, I do thank you, Lord, that for every single born-again Christian, we will be saved from the days of the Great Tribulation. It needs to come. It's prophesied to come. It will come. But not a single person has to endure it. You give a free opportunity for every single person to be saved. And so, Lord, I pray um, for all those in this room, all those who hear this message, that we would be among those who are counted worthy to escape those days, be taken home in the rapture of Jesus Christ. The only way we have that hope is when our faith is in Jesus Christ as our Savior, our Lord, the one risen from the dead, the Son of God. Lord, for those of us who are saved, help us keep our eyes on Jesus. In Him we have hope. We don't need to get depressed by this world. We don't need to get panicked by this world. We just need to be steadfast with what you've given us to do, and that's to tell others of Jesus so that they can be saved as well. And Lord, we do pray for any who might be among us today who are not sure that, Lord, when you call the church home in the rapture, that they'll be included in the numbers. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them turn to you right now in faith, asking to be saved, turning away from their sins, declaring in their heart that they believe that Jesus truly is God in the flesh who died for them and rose from the grave. And give them, then, Lord, the assurance they need that they will be included among your number in the family of God. Lord, we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.